Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. Also have a very special nursery announcement. Everybody listen very closely, okay? First of all, I want to express my appreciation for every individual who has ever volunteered for the nursery staff. Would you stand up if at any time you've ever worked in the nursery? God bless your heart. Let's give these heroes a hand. I know that you uh, work hard down there and thank you so much. Uh, for the past few months, we've been transitioning from the outside service that we were using and we bound together to create a safe and nurturing environment for our babies. And everyone has done so well. Uh, our church is growing a lot. And uh, I love that it's growing. There are three types of growth and they're all very important. I try to reiterate this every once in a while. One is uh, first generation apostolics coming in, receiving the Holy Ghost. I love that people do that here. And uh, some of you are here tonight. Uh, also people moving into the area, people transferring in is another type of growth. And, and thirdly is generational growth. And it's so important that we have all three actually, but uh, we, we want to pass this on to our next generation. And uh, fortunately, this church has experienced great growth in the generational area uh, to the point where we have more babies than people now. Um, so that's, that's great, that's from our last tally, but uh, in order, I need to announce that in order to maintain a safe environment for our small children, we will be narrowing the age for the nursery down to from six months to two years until August 30th, okay? So let me state this again. Uh, we will be narrowing the nursery age. Uh, the nursery age now will be from six months to two years until August 30th. Sister Rachel Baker has assured me they're gonna make every effort to grow our nursery staff within this time frame. And thank you to everyone, every, every person that's been involved, part of this crucial ministry. We'll also take this time to renovate the nursery as well. So the change will go into effect July 5th. That's this Sunday. Uh, isn't that this Sunday? Yeah, that's this Sunday. July 5th, 2015. So uh, nursery will be serving children from the ages of six months up to and including, everybody say and including, two years old, okay? Thank you for your dedication to our church and the church body. What a wonderful group of people. Thank God. Everybody heard that say amen. Thank the Lord. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter where you work in the kingdom. The Bible said if you give a cup of water in his name, it will not be forgotten. So thank you to everyone. Everybody understand it's important whoever takes out the trash and whoever sweeps the floor and whoever replaces the light bulbs, it takes all of us to make this work, amen? And I give you honor for helping in uh, so many different areas. Praise God. We are going to begin a series tonight uh, called Laying Hold on God's Gift. Laying Hold on God's Gift. Pursuing, the, the subtitle is Pursuing Holiness. Everybody say holiness. Praise God. Uh, I want to start uh, this laying hold on God's gift with a discussion about uh, idols and, and what people worship, okay? Um, scripture in Exodus 32 and 7 and 8, it's not on your screen, but uh, it says, the Lord said to Moses, go get down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves 
a molded calf. That's the first thing they did. They made a molded calf and worshipped it. That's the second thing they did. And sacrificed to it. That's the third thing they did. And said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So think about what people do with idols, okay, and how they worship. First of all, the, this is the progression of idol worship. First of all, they made the idol. Everybody said they made the idol. Made the idol. Second of all, they worshiped the idol. Everybody said they worshiped the idol. And third of all, they sacrificed to the idol. Everybody say they sacrificed. They sacrificed. So here's the thing about uh, that scripture and, and, and its application. First of all, a person can use their own energy and resources in a way that constructs something in life that becomes another option for our attention. They built it, right? They made their own idols. Uh, one scripture said, a man cuts down a tree and with half of it, he makes an image and with the other half, he warms himself. It's like his, he's worshiping his own energy. Uh, it's, it's, it's strange how that happens. But I've seen people that have uh, gotten an education or uh, got the job they wanted to, and, and, and all of a sudden it became something that distracts attention from Almighty God. Um, I'm talking about a, a, a career. A, a, it can be anything. It can be a motorcycle, it can be golf, it can be anything. Uh, and then the second thing that happens is once an individual has constructed an alternative to God, <clears throat> they subconsciously or consciously can begin to admire it and adore it, okay? Uh, all of a sudden, it's not just a, a, a pastime anymore, or it's not just... Uh, a house or a, or a boat or whatever, it becomes something that they admire or adore, okay? And then thirdly, finally, an individual will do without in other areas. They'll spend precious time, energy, and money to give to their idol. I mean, if that's recreation, then... If it's scuba diving, man, they'll get the best gear. They'll go to the most exotic locations. They'll find a way to worship that idol. And that's the order that it happens in. But if you turn that around, it doesn't, the, the, it doesn't fit exactly because nobody makes the Lord. He was, he's been here all along. <clears throat> but if you want to worship the one true God, first of all, we acknowledge there's one true God. And second of all, we worship, admire, and adore that one true God, right? And then as you continue to do that, finally, we'll do without in other areas. We'll spend precious time, energy, and money to give ourselves to that one true God. That's the way worship works. It's amazing uh, what people worship today. People worship a lot of different things. Uh, but... <laughs> It's interesting what the scripture says. I, I tried to, I confess, I tried to find a, a Halloween costume of what children worship today. And I found one, but honestly, even though it was a child's outfit, it was too immodest to put on the screen. It was a Katy Perry Halloween costume. And I thought, this is what people you know, what children are allowed to idolize. I talked Father's Day about the gatekeeper, but sometimes children in our culture are, are allowed or even encouraged to idolize uh, these uh, celebrities, okay? 
uh, I couldn't fix the picture well enough, and it was just a small girl, but I, 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 I was too embarrassed to put it up there. Even I, I'm thinking to myself, who would buy their child uh, an, an outfit like that? But, uh, and, and, you know, uh, she's, she's probably yesterday's news even. Uh, it, it changes so quickly um, from Disney to, you know, I can't use the word, you know. <laughs> they, they hook the kids on Disney character, people that are on the Disney channel, and then they turn into, oh, my goodness. Anybody who thinks there's not a spirit working in all that, you need to think again. But look at this scripture. I, I, I kind of have, have it out of order, uh, Sister Miranda, so I may have to go back to that next screen. Let's look at Psalm 115, 2 through 8. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands, They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. Watch this verse. Those who make them are what? Are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. You're going to worship something. You are going to worship something. But I want to warn you, whatever you worship, you will become like. Now, I don't see a lot of people, when I go into their living rooms today, I don't see a lot of uh, figures of idols. I don't see physical figures of idols there. I've walked into some homes that had one or two. Uh, you can feel spirits that come with those things. But if you worship money, you will be heartless and uncompassionate. You become like what you worship. Money has no emotion. If you worship pleasure, you will be selfish. People that worship pleasure, it may be uh, whatever uh, high that some taboo brings. But that's a drug and you become, you worship that. And it makes you narcissistic and selfish. Because pleasure is your God. It will leave you high and dry. It will leave you uh, desperate and destitute. It will. If you worship knowledge, you will be conceited. It's true. Oh, man. I'm proud of your education, but please give me a break, right? Don't drown in the storm out out there because your nose is so far in the air that you, you know what I'm saying? I don't have my little piece of paper up in my office. I'm going to get it framed. So don't feel bad at me, but I I appreciate what I learned in my education. But if you worship knowledge, it leads to condescension. And that's just distasteful, right? If you worship Jesus, you become more like him. It leads you to a life of holiness. You become like him. How many of you want to become like him? You become 
like what you worship. Amen. I like this quote uh, by Eugene Peterson. In our kind of culture, anything, even news about God, can be sold if it is packaged freshly. But when it loses its novelty, it goes on the garbage heap. Listen to this. There is a great market for religious experience in our world. That is the truth. There is a great market for religious experience in our world. There is little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue. Our little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue, little inclination to sign up for what a long, uh, for up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. You don't hear a bunch of televangelists preaching about this. We want to be like Jesus. You don't hear that all the time. Because it's all about us, right? Why would you want to live holy? Why would you want to be like Jesus? I mean, seriously, at some point it comes down to what do I get out of this? I mean, uh, I hate to say it, but there's, there is some of that in each of us, right? Why, why would I want to be like Jesus? Well, there are three main reasons. Number one, for God. Everybody say, for God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, I don't have it on the screen, I have the reference there. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Everybody say, I, I want to do it for God. That's a main reason. Number two, these are just uh, the first three reasons I'm going to give. For others, everybody say, for others. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me make sure you understand that living like Jesus and living in a way that pleases God is not about isolating yourself. It's not about digging a foxhole and saying, I'm not going to let the world in, bless God. I am going to be, uh, you know. It's not meant to be a subculture. It's meant to be a counterculture. We're not holing up in a monastery somewhere to keep the world out. We're not isolated, we're insulated. We have the armor of the Lord so we can walk into this world and be salt and light. That is what we're called to be. So in this whole discussion of, of, of laying hold on God's gift and pursuing holiness, the idea is not to, uh, to, to be separate for the sake of, of being holier than someone else. Or No, 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 no. The, the whole point is to just live like the Lord wants us to live so that we can be a contrast to the darkness. You're a city set on a hill. Let your light so shine before men. The Bible says we're a peculiar people. Some people think that means weird. That is not the origin of the word. Our English word peculiar comes from the word picus, 
which means cattle. Make you feel better? I'm a holy cow. <laughs> no, that is not the whole meaning. The reason peculiar comes from the word picus is because cattle used to be currency. You've heard of the seven cow wife, that she was so valuable that they had to trade seven cows? That's a lot of money. But the word goes back to the, the tradition they had of branding that cattle. And when you would find that cow you would see a brand on it, and it meant that that particular cow was peculiar to this ranch. So they would see some cattle wandering outside the fence or whatever, and they'd say, well, who does that belong to? And they'd check the brand and say, this, this cow belongs to the man up there on the hill. So what the Bible really is saying when it says we're a peculiar people is that when we uh, go out into this world, people ought to be able to look at us and say, mm -hmm. they belong to Jesus Christ right there. You're apostolic, aren't you? You're one of those spirit-filled people, aren't you? Do you have the Holy Ghost? Do you, are you one of those tongue talkers? Well, how'd you know I wasn't talking in tongues? So, we want to pursue holiness for others and also for ourselves. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I want to talk about that again in just a minute. I'll come back to that verse. Let me say that holiness is healthy. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, you may think I'm going a whole different direction with that, but let me read this. This uh, quote from A.W. Tozer. God is holy and holiness is the moral condition necessary to the health of his universe. Whatever is holy is healthy. I like that. Whatever is holy is healthy. The holiness of God, the wrath of God, the health of creation are inseparably united. God's wrath is his utter, listen to this, God's wrath is his utter intolerance of whatever degrades and destroys. He hates iniquity as a mother hated the polio that would take the life of her child. He hates iniquity like a mom would hate the disease that would kill her child. Don't listen to the devil. Amen. God's not trying to hold out on you. That lie has been there since the garden. Right. Yeah. Right. God knows if you eat this fruit, you're going to be smart like him. <laughs> wow. Won't you be something? What a big lie. He wants you to question God's motives. Why would God keep that from you? Why, why doesn't God want you to experience everything uh, that, that the devil tries to tempt you with? It's not because he wants to keep you from something that's good for you. It's because he wants you to be whole and healthy and make it to heaven. Would you clap your hands to the Lord if you believe that? Amen. 
Why? I'm talking about the why of, of holiness tonight a little bit. Uh, I like the fact that there's no condemnation. That's what the book of Romans says. There is therefore now no condemnation. Now listen, you got to read the whole verse. We love that no condemnation part, but you got to fulfill the condition. To those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk after the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There's no condemnation if you don't walk after the flesh. If you're trying to live as close to the world, if you're trying to live uh, half in and half out, there is, there is condemnation in that. But there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus that walk according to the Spirit. Amen? Now, the devil brings the condemnation. Conviction is from the Lord. You know? But that's to draw you to him, right? right. right? Not to keep you away from him. Uh, here's another why, to possess peace. How many of you like the peace that comes in living for God? Amen. Now let me ask maybe a, 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 a more difficult question. How many of you remember the turmoil when you weren't living for God? Isn't that a different feeling? I mean, when you're sideways with God, that's a bad feeling. Because here's what the devil does. He'll tempt you with sin. You, you commit the sin, and then he'll beat you over the head with shame associated with the sin. So you, there's no... That's why the Bible says when the Lord gives joy, he adds no sorrow to it. There's no hangover. Amen. Amen. There's no waking up on Monday morning wondering what you did Sunday night. There's no waking up uh, from some drug-induced uh, uh, high where you don't even know whose house you're in. What did Moses say? Or what did Hebrew, the book of Hebrews say about Moses? He chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. It's temporary. It is pleasure, but it's temporary. There is an expiration on it. And when the bill comes due, I've seen people that have, have uh, kind of uh, started out with God, but all of a sudden this, this uh, walk in the fence thing happened and, and they were, you know, they were, they were, all, they were trying, but, but then, then all of a sudden they get mixed up with the wrong group of people or a wrong relationship and it pulls them away and all of a sudden you, you see their life crumble. I'm not saying it happens every time, but I've seen lives crumble. People lose their job. People uh, lose their consistency because when you come to God, he puts things together. He's, he makes you whole. He makes you, he makes you a more responsible person. He, he blesses you when you start giving, you know, and you, 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 you all of a sudden, but then if you, if you, if you walk away from all that, you, you, you end up seeing the dominoes fall again. You're like, man, how did I end up here? But there's a peace that comes. What's the verse? Read it out loud with me, will you? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be spiritually minded, to think like Jesus, to be like Jesus, to walk with Jesus, to, to follow him, to, to say, okay, if that's what you want me to do, Lord, that's what I want to do. That brings life and peace. Can I tell you, 
in, a, in the most serious tone I can. I heard a preacher say one time, the Lord spoke to me and said, I can tell you the future of the people in your congregation. I can predict the future. And here's the verse. To be carnally minded is death. Can I be just blunt with you tonight? You can sit in church and fool everybody around you and go home and live like the devil. You can be sleeping around. You can be going to the wrong internet websites. You can, you can have porn on your phone. And nobody knows. But can I make a prediction? It'll kill you. That's not me talking, that's the book talking. To be carnally minded is what? That's the only place it leads. To be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. There's your prediction. You want to live and you want peace? Then draw closer to God. Say, okay, God. I'll do what you want me to do. This ain't just about missing hell. I want a better life right now. I want to be able to lay my head on my pillow at night and know that you and I are okay. I want to be able to worship with holy hands. I want to be able to lift my heart and my spirit in the presence of God. Thank God. How many of you know that's a great benefit? The peace that comes in living for him. To be like Jesus. Everybody say, to be like Jesus. That's why I want to I wanna lay hold on God's gift, to be like Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Amen. Holiness is God's nature. I don't have it on a diagram tonight. But if you put it in the center of the top of the page and you wrote the word holy, and you, and you brought two branches down from that. On the left, it could say mercy. And on the right, it would say judgment. Out of God's holy nature comes both mercy and judgment. Here's what Calvary's all about. His holiness will not let sin get in the door. But his mercy says, okay, I got to make a way to cover your sin. I'm going to come to earth, robe myself in flesh, give my life at Calvary, and pay for that sin. It has to be paid for because of my judgment. But my mercy says, I'll pay the bill. I'm going to give my life a ransom for you so that you can be free. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I think we ought to praise the Lord for that. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank you for giving your life for me, God. A number of miles from the Los Angeles basin, there's a river. The river's been dammed up by man and through genius and innovation of the engineers, they put together a dam that has, uh, in its process of working, <clears throat> housed electricity, hundreds of thousands of volts that are fed into the Los Angeles basin. If you were to go to the plant, the source, and follow the lines that come into the city, 
you'd come to various transmission plants along the way that would be marked danger, high voltage, no trespassing, danger, keep out. Hundreds of thousands of volts are available in energy for your home, but who needs 100,000 volts unless you want to burn up your home? So knowing that, the engineers have built transformers into the system. Not transmitters, but transformers. And the transformer does nothing more than break down into meaningful units the amount of electricity that you need. I... uh, I had a good childhood, but my parents missed one major uh, gift. And so I bought it when I got married. I never had one of those HO car racing sets with the little track. You feel sorry for me now, Sean? Other people have worse stories, but this is mine. (laughs) So when when I I got married, my wife must have thought I'd lost my mind. I went to Toys R Us and bought me the deal, man. I went home and put the track together and had that little trigger, man. You know, was running around the track, man. I didn't even have kids to blame it on yet. I was like... This is for my child when I have one. Right now, it's for this child. (laughs) But, you know, it came with another transformer. And uh, I had fun putting it together. But there was a little transformer on the car set, and it breaks down that 110 volts from the wall to even less. If you... the reason is if you plugged it straight in the 110 outlet, it just goes, and, and that would be the end of the car set. Right? But the transformer breaks it down to where uh, a little, little bitty car whose engine, uh, you, know, you can hold the whole thing in your fist, you know. It, it can just putt right around the track and, and entertain kids for hours. Or grown kids for hours. The transformer, it, it, it dispenses the needed level of energy. And see, that's the Holy Ghost. Yes. I don't need to part the Red Sea every day. You know, there may come a time when I need that kind of power. But dear God, I just need to get through today, bro. <laughs> I may not need to move the Grand Canyon, but God, let the Holy Ghost flow through me. Just break down enough to come into my spirit. Your Holy Ghost, your holiness, let it flow in my life so that I can touch the person that I'm talking to or doing a Bible study with or whatever. Just just let it transform into my life. Amen? Holiness consists of thinking as God thinks and willing as God wills. So said John Brown in his discourse on 1 Peter. Holiness. Here's the thing. Here's my diagram. If you've been here very long, you've seen it before. Let's go to this diagram. I hope it works. This is God. He's holy, and that's the world on the left. And when you're coming toward God, you're becoming more like him. It automatically pulls you away from the world. Have you found that to be so? I don't feel like 
punching anybody when I'm worshiping God in the altar service? Or, oh, God. Oh, I'm sorry, brother. Just came over me. I'm sorry, Brother Guerrero. I guess I need more of a, a wake here for me to worship. But <clears throat> I don't feel like cussing anybody out in the middle of service. When I'm getting closer to God, it brings me farther from the world. I don't feel like, uh, you know, doing the wrong thing when I'm in his presence. Let's go to the next slide. Here's the thing. Uh, okay, hit it again for me. There it is. Now, what is that? Boundaries. Boundaries. Only time we come up against boundaries is when we're moving away from God. There ain't no boundaries going the other way. The devil will let you smoke all the dope you want. He'll let you drink all, all the whiskey you want. There are no limits coming the other way. But God's drawing some boundaries. And he says, you know, I want you to be like I am. And the only time we run up against those is when our back is to the Lord. Think about it. I hadn't had anybody come in and say, Pastor, I'm leaving. I just want to fast more and pray more. <clears throat> and I don't feel like that I can do that here. I, I'm leaving because I just, I, I want to get so much closer to God that, uh, you know, I have to go. I may be translated before you see me next, but <laughs> I just have to go. But I have heard people say, you know what, I don't agree with this or that. Right. <laughs> I, I, I want to do whatever I want to do. And you know, there's some things just getting in the way. Because, you know, God believes in monogamy. He believes in certain principles. Right? He, he, he believes in, in, in doing the right thing. And I have had people say, you know what? I'm not interested in that. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to go where I can do what I want to do. Now, here's the thing. Holiness is a prerequisite for eternal life with God. Here's the verse I wanted to come back to, Hebrews 12, 14. This is our key verse, really. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without, everybody say without, without. which no one will see the Lord. If you break that down in the original language, the biblical scholars tell us seeing the Lord or not seeing the Lord really is talking about falling short of God's gift. Without which we will fall short of God's gift of eternal life. Without holiness, we will fall short. That's why I'm calling it laying hold on God's gift. I want life. I want that. I want to be right with him. I want to be with him eternally. But I'm going to have to pursue holiness and peace to do that. Amen? It also shows to whom we belong. Amen? Amen? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Here's the deal. Uh, come on. I, I hate to quote Bob Dylan, but you got to serve somebody. Right? You got to serve somebody. It's a joke that you're serving 
uh, nobody and that you're on your own. It's either God or the devil. You're going to live for one of them. And when you live for yourself, that by default means you're living for the enemy. Right? Because he's getting his way. It don't matter if you, he'll let you think you're living for yourself, but you're going to miss heaven either way. Amen? I remember years ago, I probably told it, but we had a, 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 a play during uh, the Halloween time of the year, and it was called The Reckoning. And we had a barn that we converted into all these different dramatic scenes. And there was this party, and then they, they drove out, and then there was an accident. And, and uh, you pulled open the barn door, and there was a crashed car with the sirens blowing and somebody laying up under that. It looked like they were hurt. And then we had the ER scene and we had actual medical professionals in there. Dr. Clay Jackson was one of them. I mean, they knew the lingo and everything. I need 33 ounces of this and I need this and I need some adrenaline, you know, or whatever. And I, and they're working on these people and, and, you know, and, and they gave me the thankless job of being in scene nine. I was at the end of the line, and that was hell. The things you do as an assistant pastor, I'm telling you, I had to be the devil. Or they asked me to be the devil, at least. I didn't pass for a teenager riding in the car, so, you know, I couldn't be a doctor. I wouldn't mind being the doctor. I just didn't know the lingo. Will you be the devil, Brother Trimble? (laughs) That's hard because the costume's cheesy usually, you know, and we had to make up a costume that wasn't cheesy and it was real dark anyway, so. But I really prayed about it. And I asked God, because these are people that are coming through guests. We want them to think about eternity, which is which is unusual for people to think about. I mean, right before my scene, they had a, a, a graveyard scene, and they walked in, and uh, there was sod nailed to the wall inside out, and they sprayed it down before every group so you could smell the dirt. You were in the, the, you were in the grave, and you looked up, and there was plexiglass, and they were having the service, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And before it was over with, they threw a spade of dirt on top of that plexiglass. It's like, oh, man, give me the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> and then they came in to see me. <laughs> but, you know, I prayed about it, and this is what I felt like the Lord gave me because I needed to have something. And to everyone that came in, I said the same thing. You thought there were three choices, saved, lost, and undecided. But I made up the third one. There is no third answer. Don't you know that we choose who we serve? We have to either choose to serve the Lord or or, or choose to reject his love and his power. And if we're going to choose to serve him, that means becoming more like him and drawing close to him and pursuing holiness. It's his nature. We are not our own anymore. Amen? Amen. We, we, it's, it's the dedication. I'll, let's stand together. I'll finish up with these verses here. Romans 12 and 1, let's read it out loud together. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. We had a rough week last week. America took another step down. This is not a Christian nation. What are we going to do? Wring our hands and give up? No. We need to do better at shining the light and being the salt of the earth. There is a great contrast. Let me remind you, everyone without God is a sinner. Everyone without God needs his help. Everyone. 
That means the fornicator, the adulterer, uh, the homosexual person, the, the, whoever it is, everybody needs God. He died for every one of them. That's our job. It doesn't matter what the world legalizes. They're going to keep, hey, brace yourself. They're going to keep legalizing uh, sin until Jesus comes. The study I've done about things, uh, I probably said it before, I said it to someone recently, I believe in my lifetime, if the Lord tarries, it will be legal to marry a machine. That's not hyperbole. I really believe that'll happen. But you know what? It doesn't matter what, what the world does. What matters is if we are becoming more like him and shining his light. God, I want those voltage, that voltage coming through me, transforming me so that when I walk out in this world, people that are hurting, people that have tried it all. You, you haven't heard the end of this. They already have states where they've had problems because they don't have a way for same-sex couples to divorce. The laws are not in place. You mean it didn't work out? Hey, welcome to the real world. Just because a nation legalizes something doesn't mean it's going to be utopia. People still have loneliness. People still have problems. People still have sin. People still have shame. People still have things they're dealing with. People still get sick. Everybody needs God. That didn't change last week. So why don't we pursue him? Why don't we live more like him? It ain't about just being different for the sake of being different, but the book says come out from among them and be separate. It's true that we don't embrace the values of our world. Amen. Amen. Jesus was counterculture all the way, right? And he lived it in a day that was difficult as well. Let's lay hold on God's gift. Let's pursue holiness. Let's be more like him. What do you say? Can we come together and pray and say, God, make me more like you. I want to be more like you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to be more like you. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. serve you Lord I just want to please you I want to live my life in a way that honors you God I want to be a light to this world God hallelujah 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 thank you Jesus thank you Jesus come on let's seek the face of the Lord God, I want to please you. I don't want to take my cue from this world. I want to listen to your voice. I want to, I want to believe your word, God, and I'll, I'm going to do what pleases you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's about your relationship with him. Your relationship with him. In the name of Jesus. I want to lay hold on your gift, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to be more.